Greetings and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV. And we are still on the Solar Coaster series. I thought we would be, um, well, we're just going to move on. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> How's everybody out there today? Thank you so much for joining and being part of the podcast. Um, whenever you view it, um, I see that a lot of people are coming on that are Kelly Nation supporters. And I'm so grateful that you're here. Um, we are we are reading from Solar Coaster, A Diary of Me by R. Kelly. And we're going to get right into it. So let's get going. So now we're on the um, segment of Nice. Never enough. How do you get to be a man when you got no man to show you what it means to be a man? You look around you. You see what the other guys want. You see how the other guys do. What I saw was that all the guys with the most swag all had more than one woman. In grammar school, the girls looked at me as someone who couldn't even read. In high school, even when I started singing, the girls who knew me from the classroom remembered I could barely get through a sentence without stumbling all over myself. I heard them laughing. I saw their smirks. All that rejection shit hurt. But Nice showed me love. Nice was true. Lenice should have been enough, but with this newfound success, my pride started blowing up and my ego took over. Ego started filling up all the holes of youthful insecurity. Ego made me think that one girl wasn't enough. Ego made me want to taste every single flower. Ego had me thinking I was all that. I was slim, cut up, and strong. I went from playing on the street to performing in clubs where I'd jump on top of a giant speaker and start singing and stripping at the same time. I liked showing off my voice and my body. Ego had me following a short shorty to the crib because she said her roommate didn't mind. Her roommate was real friendly too. Ego had me freaking. Niece had me loving. Ego said, go crazy. Nice said, go easy. Ego said, the more the merrier. Nice said, it's you and me, Rob. It's all about you and me. Nice said, Rob, let's go out to Barber's or Baker Square and get that delicious coconut cream pie we love so much. Nice said, let's live happily ever after. My mother said, I love Nice. Nice said, I love your mother. Nice and I started talking about moving in together. We were moving on up. Um, we were styling. We were happy. It was all good. Abducted by my gift. Sometimes I feel like I've been abducted by my gift, kidnapped and taken away to a musical place never to be found again. Music possessed me in a way that sometimes scared me. It kept growing inside me. Everywhere I go, everywhere I turn and everything I do, the lyrics and melodies are always right there, constantly reminding me that there is no escape. Sometimes I feel like music has made love to me, and sometimes I feel like music just has sex with me. I feel I'm pregnant by music, and it is the father and mother of my child, and there will be no denying that. One day I was riding in a car with one of my homies who was a drug dealer. He had a brand new Mercedes Benz. Matter of fact, he has several nice cars. He was older than me, and I looked up to him, not because of this line of work, but because he believed in me. He always told me that I would be big and have it all. He would protect me from the game bangers because we played basketball for money in the hood and we would win a lot. Believe it or not, I had a sweet jump shot on me. When we would win sometimes, the other guys did not want to pay up. They would try to lie and say that I traveled or that I was cheating. That would always happen close to us winning the game or on the game winning shot itself. And my partner would always make sure nothing went down and that we got paid. I never judged or knocked his hustle because I feel like whatever he did didn't concern me. Besides that, he respected me to the point where he never involved me in any of his business. He would pick me up every Saturday morning and we would go hoop. And we would always talk about music on the way there and on the way back. What was new and what was hot? What songs we liked and what songs we didn't? He loved music just as much as I did, except... He was not musically gifted. He would always ask me to sing for some of his family members or even sometimes some of his girlfriends. The family members I was cool with singing for. 
but the girlfriends I was not so cool with because sometimes after I would sing to them, I would feel in my spirit and I could also see it in their eyes that they wanted me. And that would be a little uncomfortable for me. But because he was my boy, I sing. Coming from playing basketball one day, my friend took me on a drive. We were on Interstate 57, way south of the city, heading to the Burbs. He had business out there. We were going down Lincoln Highway through the village of Madison to to a place called Olympia Fields, where the houses are big, the lawns lush and green, and vibe classy and calm. I was about 16 or 17 years old. Suddenly, I noticed a huge mansion made from giant logs. It was like a log cabin that grew up to be a mansion. The house was way back behind a huge gate on a plot of land bigger than a football field. Stop, I said. I got out the car and walked up to the gate, amazed by what I saw. At my age, if you had told me that this was heaven compared to where I lived, I would have believed it. I put my hands on the gate and just stared at this house. I'd never seen anything so beautiful. This is the McDonald's house, said my friend. The guy who runs a bunch of McDonald's franchises owns it. I learned much later that James Morrow's, one of the first 50 owner operators of McDonald's restaurants, owned the McDonald's house. This is going to be my house one day, I said. Yeah, young blood, you could have a house just like this. I looked back at him and said, no, I'm going to have this house. Say what? I just know I will. You're crazy, Rob. I didn't argue. I didn't have to. I knew it was going to happen. My friend started talking, but I held on to the gate and closed my eyes and began to drown him out, telling myself that when I opened my eyes, this house would be mine. And then we left back to the hood and the hustle. Shooting stars. All my life, I'd heard about the city of Los Angeles and all of its glory, from music stars to movie stars. It was the land of fortune and fame. Although the stories I heard about, it seemed like a book of fairy tales, I wanted it and had to have my name written into the story. I knew LA was a step in the right direction. I had been hearing about it as long as I could remember. Miss McClain always talked about LA and big time producers like Quincy Jones. There was a producer who was making a name for himself who asked me if I wanted to go to LA. He had put together a five member group that needed a lead singer. I auditioned and got the gig. It was 1984 and five member groups like New Edition were hot, Cool It Now was the number one R&B song in the country. Can you write songs as good as that? Asked the producer. I can, I said, and I did. I wrote four killer songs for the group. Another writer named Chuck E. Booker who also written a bunch of tunes for us to sing. We flew out to LA and Chicago. It was winter in LA, it was summer. LA was all sunshine and palm trees. We stayed in a little apartment where we slept on the floor, but who cared? I was in LA, baby. I was on my way. The producer told us he lo he locked up a deal for us at A&M Records. Same label where Quincy Jones himself produced all those funky hits for the Brothers Johnson. Right now, the label is listening to everything we've written. They're deciding which song should go on the, re the record. While they were deciding, we went to the photographer's studio for our first publicity shot. Man, this was Hollywood. Next day, the producer came in and announced that the songs AMM wanted us to record. All four of mine had been chosen. When I looked at the list, though, I didn't see my name next to my songs. I didn't get any credit. It's not about individual credit, said the producer. It's a group effort. The singing is, I said, but I wrote those songs alone. Sorry, Rob, but the deal's done. The songwriting and publishing are part of a group deal. I can't give you any ownership of that, but don't worry. We'll be getting an advance. There'll be enough money for everyone. That night I called my mother. It doesn't seem right to me, she said. That's what I think, but we're set to go in the studio in a few days. What can I do now? Demand your credit. I did. They won't give me any. Then just come on home, son. Just get up and leave. Well, look at it this way, Rob. If they screw you now, they're going to screw you later. Cheating is cheating, Robert. I wouldn't mess with those folks. Three days before the recording session, I told the group goodbye. They were furious. They accused me of dogging them. But as far as I'm concerned, I wasn't dogging anyone. I was doing what was right. I did what I've always wound up doing. I came home to Chicago. I wasn't home all that long when I felt like I had to try again. 
LA had kicked my butt once, but it wasn't about to quit, but I wasn't about to quit. I know you're discouraged, says mom, and you've got every right to be. The music business is cold-blooded, son. It's testing you. It's saying how bad you want it, boy. If you want it bad enough, you'll stay with it. If you don't want it that bad, you'll quit. But I just can't see myself quitting. Her baby wasn't quitting. I was focusing on the future just like she taught me. I was going back to LA, super intent on coming home with a record deal. I won't be gone all that long, I told Lanice. I don't want you there at all, Rob. I've got to keep after it, I said. I've got to catch my dream as long as I'm still a part of it. Baby, I told her, you are the dream. I want to to come with you, said niece. Wish you could, baby, I said, but I don't have enough money for me. How could I support the two of us as soon as something happens, though? I'm sending for you, I promise. The music business is cold-blooded, son. It's testing you. It's saying how bad you want it, boy. This is Robert Kelly, he said, our next superstar. Stars. I looked up at the sky from Venus Beach on the west side of Los Angeles. The midnight air was sweet. The weather mild. The ocean breeze perfect. No one was bothering me. I was out there on the sand, laid out on a blanket. That big old full moon shone down on me like a giant spotlight. The sound of the roaring waves was hypnotizing. I closed my eyes and thought, I can do it. I can make it. I can make it in Cali. It didn't matter that I didn't have a place to stay, that I was living homeless on the beach. It didn't matter that I was carrying my clothes in a paper bag. Niece, her folks sent me enough money so I could eat and buy a few clothes. When it came time to enter an amateur contest in clubs like the Red Onion, I would clean up. I got on the stage and killed. But damn it to, kill, to hell, I never won. Never. I never won a single contest in LA. I knew I was better than the other contestants. I knew I had talent, but it seemed like I was the only one who knew it. I got a better response on the streets than in clubs. As a street performer in Venus Beach, I attracted crowds with no keyboard or guitar. I just belted out a big ballad like Distant Lover and wound up with a few bucks. Of course, the competition in LA was fiercer than Chicago. There were jugglers, comics, and painters. There was every form of artist imaginable hawking her or his wares alongside me. I missed home. I missed my mother and Lenise. I missed my crew and the comforts of Chicago. But I wasn't going back, not this time, not without some sign of success. I was like a junkyard dog. Once I got my teeth into something, I wouldn't let go. I kept hustling. One thing led to another, and I got the name of a big shot music executive at Warner Records, Benny Medina. Everyone had heard of Benny Medina. At the time of 24, at, at the age of 24, Benny worked for Motown and was considered Barry Gordy's protege. He worked with artists like Ray Charles, Rick James, Madonna, Fleetwood Mac, Biz Marquis, and Big Daddy Kane. The show, the TV show Fresh Prince of Bel Air, would be based on his life growing up. Benny could definitely sign me to a deal. Benny agreed to see me on the phone. He said, come to my office. I'll see what you can do for me. And then you'll see what I can do for you. I arrived a half hour earlier sitting in a chair outside Medina's office was a light skinned black guy waiting for Benny, just like me. We started talking. He said, he sang, how about you? I'm a singer too. I said, he went in first half hour later. It was my turn. Benny Medina was cool, said Go over to the piano and play whatever you like. I'd like to play my originals, I said. I want to hear them, Robert. I played him 12 songs. Benny was knocked out. Man, you're something, Robert. He said, you're great. These are brilliant songs and your voice is tremendous. Come with me right now so I can introduce you to everyone in the building. I was on cloud, cloud nine. Benny took me to meet all the other execs and producers. This is Robert Kelly. He said, our next superstar. Does this mean I'm in? I asked Benny. Yes, sir. Just give me a week or two and I'll get right back to you with the papers. I called practically everyone I knew in Chicago. My mother said, if it's going to take a little work, to get up a contract, come home and do the waiting here. 
I had just enough for a plane ticket, so I flew home. I had moved into the basement of Lanisa's grandma, Cheryl's house. Meanwhile, I couldn't stop thinking about that pending contract from Warner Records and, my, and Mr. Benny Medina. A week passed, then two, then three. I called Medina's office. He's out. Called again. He's He was on the phone. Called a third time. He was gone for the day. Another week passed. I kept calling. Benny kept ducking. By week five, I was feeling desperate. I was calling every day. His secretary was so sick of me. The second she heard my voice, she said, Mr. Medina cannot come to the phone. Why can't he just tell me what's happening? He is telling you, she said. You're just not listening. But he's not saying anything. That's the point. Mm, big break. Big break. I spent my late teens missing the brass ring. My early 20s were the same story. One day, soon after I got back to Chicago, we were all sitting around watching music videos on TV at my mother's house. The video song was called Off On Your Own came on. Wait a damn second, I shouted, jumping off the old sofa. Who is that? That's I'll be sure, said niece. That's the light-skinned guy who was sitting next to me outside Benny Medina's office. I tried, but I couldn't find love in Hollywood. Every single door, and I mean every single door, was open and closed on me. A hundred talent shows, and I was never the winner. A hundred possible breaks, but none of them ever broke my way. When I get back from L.A., I decided to take a different approach. I did my homework and studied the market. Solo singers like Jeffrey Osborne weren't as popular as they used to be, and since New Edition came out a few years earlier, the group look was on the rise. Now you'd hear the boys doing down my heart tony 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 hit with little walter johnny gill once on a once a straight up r&b singer joined new edition and got hits with if it isn't love and you're not my kind of girl teddy riley's group guy was all over the radio i decided i was going to get the break i'd been looking for with the group in 1987 I found three guys who could dance and sing i put the group together became the lead singer and then set to work you got a name, baby, asked niece. R. Kelly and MGM for musically gifted men. Why R. Kelly? Why not just Robert Kelly? Maybe it was the stories my mother used to tell me about my great soul singers of the past. Or maybe it was those trips to plays and operas that Miss McClin took, with, took me to. Whatever it was, I knew instinctively that I needed a hook to get noticed. Robert is too ordinary. R sounds more mysterious. It's got intrigue behind it. People would be asking, who is this R. Kelly? R with, will get lots more attention than Robert. During the mid-80s and into the 90s, New Jack Swing, a sound that for the first time blended R&B melody with hip-hop beats, was all the rage. Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Teddy Riley were considered its pioneers. The sound of music was changing and exciting. Rap music beats were influencing R&B music and creating something new. I wrote a bunch of songs incorporating the beats that defined the New Jack feel, as well as a couple of ballads which my mother loved. The group idea was working. It wasn't long before opportunity came our way. R. Kelly and MGM started making some noise. We blew up. In Chicago, we were working practically every night. The ladies were screaming, but the money wasn't coming in yet. Our manager even signed us to a small record company based in New York and Miami. They put out a single and even made a video for a song I wrote called Why You Want to Play Me. But just as things started going our way, jealousy worked its way into the group. Because it was doing, because I was doing all the creative work, writing and producing the song, singing lead, choreographing and imagining um, and imaging the group, I felt envy behind my back. I heard whispers and saw unhappy glances. I knew there was a problem, but in 1990, when we were asked to go on the big break, a TV show hosted by Natalie Cole, where first prize was $100,000, I put those issues aside. We went out to the West Coast. The contest had three levels and you had to win the first two to get to the finals. We won the first round hands down. Then we won the second. Now it was time for the third, the one that would pay us $100,000. Our uniforms were okay, but I didn't think they were flashy enough for the finals. So on my own, I went out and started street performing. And just like before, I made good money. I took my earnings and bought killer outfits, custom made by Barbara Bates, a Chicago-based designer, 
who was making clothes for all the stars. We were ready. Back in the dressing room in the Hollywood studio, an hour before we were due to sing, the other guys came up and said, Rob, we don't like, think it's fair that you get half the money and we got to split the other half between us. We think if we win this 100000 we should split it four ways. You decided to just spring this on me minutes before the show, I asked. We just want you to, we, we just want to get it straight. We want what's fair. I was pissed. I write the songs I said. I do the agreements. I'm the lead singer. I create the steps. I give you your parts, rehearse those parts, tell you if you're flat or sharp. I do 90% of the work and you want to me to have 25% of the reward? No, sir. Words were exchanged. First fist started flying. We finally cooled it and said, tell you what, fellas, you guys go out without me. If you win, you keep everything or I'll go out alone. If I win, I'll keep everything. That's fair, right? My offer made them even matter. They didn't accept. They accused me of manipulation. Meanwhile, Natalie Cole had heard all the noise coming from our dressing room and decided to cancel our appearance. Look, I told the guys, this is crazy. We'll figure out the splits later. Let's forget this fighting and just go out there and kill. Everyone agreed and we sweet talked Natalie into letting us back on. We went out and killed. We won. The big break was ours. We went back to Chicago conquering heroes. Nothing left to do but wait for my share of the prize money to come. I waited and I waited some more. Okay. <clears throat> Amazing Grace. Hate is heavy and in my heart, I'm not a hater. I've got a loving nature, a forgiving nature, but it was hard to drop my upset when my share from the big break prize money was so slow in coming. I decided to be patient though because my mother said patience always pays. I was patient for a month, then another month and a third. Soon my patience was gone. Somehow the money disappeared. I didn't get a dime of the $100,000 in cash and prizes. For all I know, I got lost in the mail. Um, but for all I know, it got lost in the mail, but I blamed MGM. I decided that I couldn't deal with them anymore. Our manager decided to stick with the group. I had no choice but to forget MGM forever. Around this time, I went to an audition at the original Regal Theater where a producer was putting on a musical gospel. Don't get God started, starring Vanessa Bell Armstrong and Marvin Winans of the Winans, two gospel greats. I figured I sang good enough to get a part, but I missed the bus and arrived late. The security guard told me the auditions were over and to go home. I can't go home. I said, I came to sing. They all, they all threw singing in there. I let out a big sigh. I thought about leaving, but something inside of me said no. Instead, I started singing my mother's favorite song, Amazing Grace, sang it loud and proud. The security guard looked at me like I was crazy, but before he could say anything, this lady showed up. I recognized her as the actress from Good Times who played Penny's birth mother on the show. Her name was Chip Fields and Penny was her 11 year old Janet Jackson. In real life, her daughter Kim Fields played Tootie on the 80s show, The Facts of Life. Turned out she had a big part in the play too. Wow, said Miss Fields, you can really sing. Thank you, ma'am. Let me give you a script. I wanna hear you read for this part. The word read was a dagger to my heart. I couldn't let her know I couldn't read. Couldn't let her see me stumble over the words I didn't understand. Oh, I can't read today, I said, scrambling for an excuse, because I am I forgot my glasses. No problem, said Miss Fields. You just take the script home with you and go over it tonight. Come back tomorrow when the producer arrives from Los Angeles. That's Barry Hankerson. You'll, you've heard of him, haven't you? No, ma'am, I answered. He manages the Winans, Vanessa Bell Armstrong, Gladys Knight. He's going to love your voice. There is the part of a young preacher in this play that you're perfect for. So let me give you $5 for care, car fare. Please show up tomorrow at noon. I took the money and thanked Miss Fields again. You're, you're forgetting the script, she reminded me. I went back and got the script. The script, of course, was a problem. I can't read the script. I told mom soon as I got home. Every time I look at it, the words start wiggling and it's like being back at school. This is my big chance and I'm about to lose it. 
There's no need for you to lose it, son. You just need to tell the truth. Tell them you can sing better than anyone, but your reading is not the best. It's the worst. They'll help you with your reading, son. Just go over there tomorrow and tell the truth. I was nervous. Couldn't even fall asleep for all the butterflies in my stomach. I opened up the script and tried making sense of the story, but that didn't work. I couldn't keep the character straight. Couldn't comprehend the meaning. Didn't know what the play was saying. Tomorrow was going to be hell. Tomorrow turned into today. I was out of the bed by 8 a.m. still trying to figure out the script. It was no use. I decided not to show up. Then I changed my mind. I had to go through with the audition. But how? Riding the bus on the way over, I kept hearing my mother's words. Just tell the truth. When I arrived, Miss Fields was happy to see me. You studied the script, she said. The truth is, I hesitated. The truth is that I don't read very well. Don't worry about that, baby, she said. I know a lot of people in show business who don't read well. We can help you with that. Don't worry about reading today. Just sing. The producer's here and he wants to hear you sing. Sing what? Sing Amazing Grace like you did yesterday. I went out on the stage of the Regal Theater. I looked out into the audience, but it was too dark to see who was sitting there. I took a deep breath and sang Amazing Grace. That's it. I heard a man's voice cry. He's got the part. I saw the man walking toward the stage, medium built, light skin, eyebrows looked like they were stitched together. Man, he was dressed sharp. I'm Barry Hankerson, he said, and I'm offering you $700 a week to do this play, plus expenses. I was so green, I didn't know what plus expenses meant. I thought it was his way of being slick. Trying to prove that I was nobody fool, I said, I can't go with that plus expenses business. Everyone laughed at me. Don't worry about it, son, said Hankerson. We'll get all the details worked out. You just come back tomorrow. I ran home and told everyone the good news, but the next day when I showed up at the theater, I decided I needed to take another approach. Look here, Mr. Hankerson, I said, I'm not really right for this part. Can't read the lines very well, and I'm not good at memorizing. I'm an artist. I got me a bag of, dem of demos, and I just want you to hear three or four of my songs. Will you do that for me, sir? I will, he said. I'll listen to them right now. I pulled three cassettes out the bag. The first was an early version of Turn Back the Hands of Time. The second was Honey Love, and the third was Dedicated. Hankerson's assistant took the tapes and one after another put them into a boombox. Hankerson stood the whole time listening to every note. When the last song played, he said, you're right, you're an artist. You've got a real gift, son. That audition turned out to be the first time I met the man who would become my manager. All right, so we're done um, for today and tomorrow um, on podcast 10, because this is podcast nine, we're going to be looking at public announcement and how he became who he is as R. Kelly. So God bless you. I thank you for liking, joining, and commenting on this video. And let me know what you're feeling right now. I mean, finally, things are coming together for him because he had so many ups and downs and so many people that played him. And I mean, they played him tremendously. And um, But yeah, now it's his big break. His big break wasn't a big break. It was the break after the big break. But yeah, so leave your comments and thank you so much for being part of the premiere and whenever you watch the videos please do so we have our um playlist on the um on the channel and you can check them out whenever you feel like it all right until next time keep it 100